It's Wednesday night, and we are in a study of the Old Testament. We're working our way through the Old Testament. We've come to Genesis. We've gone from the beginning, uh, which is the first chapter, Genesis 1. i got many things to say about that chapter, and that chapter is a predestination chapter. Genesis is the first chapter, but I'm not going to tell you what it's about. If you want to know, you'll have to write for it. And then you get into Adam being created and Eve in that second chapter, in the third chapter. Eve eats of the tree that God put in the garden, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And they had to eat because he made them out of the corrupt dust between verses 1 and 2 of Genesis 1. Then you, we went all the way through Genesis. We went through uh, Cain killing Abel in the fourth chapter, and we went through uh, the fifth chapter, the lineage of God, starting with Adam, tracing ba Adam back to God, and then going down through Seth and Enosh, and all these sons down to Noah, and Shem, his son, and then Shem takes us all the way down in the eleventh chapter. His son, Arphaxad, takes us to Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Jacob's name is changed to Israel. This is a family bloodline. Then we went on into... Uh, Abraham, in the 11th chapter, comes on the scene. God promises, and that's also the chapter where Babylon is begun by Nimrod. Babylon at the first part of the chapter, and Abraham at the, or Abram uh, at the end of the chapter. And then Abram is called out of Ur of the Chaldees, Ur of the Chaldees. That's the same thing as Babylon. Ur is down here, down here on the upper part, just above the Persian Gulf, this is what we call Iraq, that is the old land of Babylon. And uh, we Abraham is called out of Ur of the Chaldees because he's a descendant of Shem, and Shem's descendants, when they landed on the mountains of Ararat, descended down here, they migrated down to this Mesopotamian valley. Mesopotamia means between the rivers, between the Tigris and the Euphrates River. Babylon was founded on the Euphrates River and the capital of Assyria, Nineveh, was right about where Baghdad is on the Tigris River. In upper Mesopotamia was the Assyrian Empire headquarters. Lower Mesopotamia was the headquarters of the Babylonian Empire. And then uh, we went into the 12th chapter, going to Abraham, Isaac, and then Jacob. And they get the land of Israel. That's promised to Abraham in the 17th chapter. Well, actually, he promises in the 12th chapter. He promises him a son in the 15th chapter, and he's too old to have children, but God says you're going to have one anyway. And then get down to Jacob's name is changed to Israel, and then he has 12 sons that become the nation. And then we know the story. Uh, his 11th son, uh, which is Joseph, is sold over there into, into Egypt by his brothers in the 37th chapter. And then we know the story when Joseph is there and his brothers come over there for food because of the famine in the land. And then Joseph rises up, brings his family over to Egypt, and they're there for 400 years. They're put into bondage in Exodus, the first chapter, and Exodus, the 12th chapter. Exodus, the first chapter, they go into bondage. And then in the second chapter, Moses is born. And then God calls Moses in the third chapter out of the burning bush. And then he goes uh, to Pharaoh, and, and then he delivers Israel in the 12th chapter. That's the first Passover. When I see the blood over the doorpost of the house, I will pass over you and the firstborn, just like our firstborn will be spared and we'll have a new body to go with these new, these new souls that we've got. And then they come to, they're leaving Egypt, and they come to the Mount, the Holy Mount of God, which is Mount Sinai, down here probably somewhere in the south desert of this Sinai Peninsula here. Here's the the Red Sea down here. And they somewhere in that neighborhood, they go to Mount Sinai. And there in the 18th chapter, they arrive there. The 19th chapter, Moses goes up into the mountain, starts talking to God. The 20th chapter, he brings down the Ten Commandments. And then we've worked our way through here, and he stays at the mountain through Numbers, the 8th chapter. Numbers 8. 
And so all these adventures, and we're getting into the construction of the temple of God and where we are. Moses is receiving the, the instruction from God in Exodus, the 25th chapter, about building the temple. We're going to get into the 26th chapter. I thought we'd get to that tonight, but I think that's going to be a few weeks down the road. Now, where we are, we're in the 26th chapter. Excuse me, 25th chapter. In the 25th chapter is the first time tabernacle is mentioned. Now, tabernacle actually has the same meaning as temple. It is the word mishkan, M-I-S-H-K-A-N, M-I-S-H-K-A-N. Now, you've got, in the Old Testament, you have two common words as the word uh, that's been translated tabernacle. You have the word mishkan means a shepherd's hut. Or a lair, a lair. You hear me use the word lair, L-A-I-R. Lair is a home, a place a person lives. We speak of an animal's lair, a cave where a, a bear lives back in that cave or where a fox is den. Those are lairs. A lair is a place or a home. And it means a lair for animals. It also means... A temple. The word tabernacle means a temple or a place of habitation. And did God live in the temple? Well, certainly he did. He dwelt between the cherubim. He dwelt between the cherubim. And that's where the Ark of the Covenant was. He dwelt there. The word dwelt means to to build a house, or it means to marry. Now, the Bible teaches us in that 54th chapter of Isaiah that God was married to Israel, and that the God that was married to Israel was the Holy One. And Peter stood at Pentecost and told the Pharisees, you killed the Prince of Life, you denied the Holy One, <coughs> and denied Jesus, so they contradicted Jesus. So Jesus is married to Israel. Jesus is married to the church. Does he have two wives? No, he has one church, one body, one wife. And husbands love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her in Ephesians 5.25. God doesn't love everybody. He only loves his wife. He only died for his wife. <coughs> that's what the Bible says. <coughs> now, what we're going to be doing, you say, what in the world do you need Exodus for when you're talking about uh, the New Testament? Remember, the Old Testament is a shadow. Let's look at, there's three particular verses I want us to look at. When it speaks of a shadow, skia, shade, a shade. Look over here in, in Colossians. In Colossians. Well, well, let me, before we go to Colossians, let's go to, let's go to Hebrews 10. Go to Hebrews 10 first. This will probably be best. Go to Hebrews 10. Three particular verses I want you to look at concerning the word shadow. Now, Hebrews 10 and 1. For the law. The law is everything here in the Old Testament when God built this temple and he gives all of this to Moses from that 20th chapter through the 8th chapter of Numbers. But the law is Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. The Jews would classify this as the law and everything after that in the Old Testament, they would call the prophets. God classifies the law and the prophets all together. But as far as specific laws, God gives Moses on the mountain from the 20th chapter to, of Exodus through the 8th chapter of Numbers, he gives him specific daily laws to live by. And during these chapters, he is telling them how to build the temple. Why do we need to know this? Because in the New Testament... 
Everything over here was a shadow. It was a shade. The New Testament is the very image. That's what this, that's what, and that word image is the word icon. It means likeness. It's the same word for whom he did foreknow. He also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son, that he be the firstborn of his of many brethren. And that word like that word image is the word icon, likeness. So everything in the Old Testament was a likeness to the New Testament. Spiritual Israel, heavenly Jerusalem, the church, that's Hebrews 12, 22. You have to study the old to understand the new. You have to understand the new to understand the old. They both go together. The law having a shadow of good things to come, to come from the time of the Old Testament and not the very image of things could never with those sacrifices which they offered year by year continually make the comers there into perfect, or they could not teleos them, they could not, you remember that word from Sunday morning, could not perfect the people, make them mature. For then would they not have ceased to be offered because that the worshippers once purged should have had no more conscience of sins if they'd have done it the first time they did it. So they offered them every year. What were they for? They were shadows of the New Testament. Every offering that was offered was a picture of Christ to come, and they were pictures of us being lambs to the slaughter daily and taking our cross daily and dying daily. They had a lamb offered every morning about sunup, and one offered every evening about sundown, somewhere around 6 o'clock in the morning, 6 o'clock in the evening, and we're lambs to the slaughter every day. And every sacrifice was offered with an oblation. That's a bread offering. A bread offering. So we are the sacrifice daily. We take our crosses and die daily, and we eat of this bread daily, which is the Word of God. Everything is a shadow in the Old Testament. And I'm just going to do some reading to you. And he says, For then would they not have ceased to be offered if those sacrifices in the Old Testament could have taken away sin, they wouldn't have kept offering them every year, every day. But they didn't take away sin. Because that the worshippers once purged should have no more conscience of sin. But in, the, but in those sacrifices there is a remembrance again made of sins every year. It is not possible that the blood of bulls and of goats should take away sin. Wherefore, when he cometh into the world, he saith, Sacrifice and offering thou wouldest not, but a body hast thou prepared me. Now the body is Christ. The body is of Christ, and that's the church. In burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin, thou hast no pleasure. Then said I, Lo, I come in the volume of the book. It is written of me, to do thy will, O God, above when he saith, Sacrifice and offering and burnt offerings and offering of sin, thou wouldest not, neither hast pleasure therein, which offered by the law. God's not pleased with the sacrifices. Those were examples of everything in the new. Not only Christ on the cross, but of us dying daily on a daily cross. Then said he, Lo, I come to do thy will, O God, he takes away the first in the Old Testament to establish the second in us daily. That we may establish the second by the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. No more sacrifices for sin. He's the one sacrifice. And every priest standeth daily ministering and offering oftentimes the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever. Now, the Roman Catholics say they offer sacrifices every day. They say they perform the Mass. The Mass is, they say within the Mass is the real presence of Christ. Real presence is a Roman Catholic term. It means his body and blood is present in that Eucharist when they raise the Eucharist up and say, Hocus corpus em fili, and they say it turns into the literal body and blood of Christ. And they walk down the aisle and accept the Eucharist or accept Christ, and that's where accept Christ comes from. It's the walking down the aisle and accepting the Eucharist. And the Eucharist is the Christ Mass or Christmas 
And that's paganism, no matter whether people like it or not. From henceforth, expect until his enemies be made his footstool, for by one offering he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. Wherefore, the Holy Ghost also is witness to us, for after that he had said already, this is the covenant. Here's the covenant of God that I will make with them after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws into their hearts. He's written upon fleshy tables of our hearts with the finger of God, hasn't he? If I with the finger of God cast out devils, then the kingdom of God or Israel has come to you. Their minds will I write them, and their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. Now where remission of these is, there is no more offering for sin. All these rituals of these offerings simply pointed to Christ. That's all they were for. Let me put this over here. Let me erase this up here. Everything in the Old Testament is a shadow. New Testament is the very image we are Jews of the heart. We're circumcised of the heart. God has sp sprinkled our hearts. The Ark of the Covenant was sprinkled in the Old Testament. Christ is Melchizedek, holds that office, and He is sprinkling our hearts. Now, here's the... So when we're talking about the patterns of the temple, we're talking about everything that is us in the New Testament. Everything. The first place you find that word tabernacle is in the 25th chapter of Exodus, the ninth verse. He says, the, I'm, I want you to make a pattern of the tabernacle. And the tabernacle was built into Solomon's temple in that seventh chapter, starting that seventh chapter of First Kings over in Second Chronicles. Sixth chapter, you'll see a lot of the same things it says in the seventh chapter of 1 Kings. So, the first place you find tabernacle, which means a temple or a house or a habitation, and we are God's house. Christ is the son of his own house. Whose house are we in Hebrews 3, 6? And how could all this be without God preordaining it? Was it an accident? No. Does God know who his house is? This was called the house of God. The Ark of the Covenant was sprinkled. You had inside the Ark of the Covenant, you had Aaron's rod that budded. We rule with the scepter of righteousness. That's in our hearts. Hebrews 1 and 8. Hebrews 1 and 8. We rule with a rabdos, R-E-B-D-O-S, of euthetos. It comes from you and tithome. It means a well leveling to the will of God. That is the rod that we use that's equivalent to Aaron's rod that budded. Well, Aaron's rod that budded, God said, bring me 12 rods, one from each tribe, and the one that springs forth and blooms and resurrects, that will be my ruler, the one that will be the priesthood. Well, have we resurrected? Do we spring to life? Yes, that's the same picture. The law was written on tables of stone. And over there, and we just got through saying, he said, I'll write it in their hearts. Says the same thing on the 8th chapter. Says, I'll write it in their hearts. And over here, the law is written in fleshy tables of our hearts. There in, in 2 Corinthians, the, first chapter, uh, the third chapter, the first four verses there, fleshy tables of the heart. Fleshy tables. And the, and the pot of manna was in the Ark of the Covenant. And the bread, which is the Word of God, is in our hearts. Word of God or bread. And the Bible, and let's go ahead and read the rest of this. Their sins and iniquities will I remember no, no more. Now where remission of these is, there's no more offering for sin. Having therefore, brethren... Boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus. Well, they took once a year, high priest would take the blood of a goat, not a lamb. When the Bible says God had made him to be sin for us in that fifth chapter of 2 Corinthians, he made 
He made he put the sin on Christ. Goats are a type of sin. They're unbelief. God took the blood of the goat and sprinkled it once a year by the high priest, went through the veil and sprinkled it on the Ark of the Covenant seven times. Boy, that don't make any sense to us, does it? The day on the day of atonement was Jesus the goat. Well, he wasn't a goat, but God made him that in our place, didn't he? As a substitute. The reason the goat had to die was for the sins of all the people of Israel. And that was on the tenth day of the seventh month. Tenth day, seventh month. Now, and there's so much more in this. Law is written, we're the bread. Now, the Bible says there in Revelation, the fourth chapter and fifth chapter, that the prayers of the saints, of saints, that this is the, the altar of incense that goes up as a sweet-smelling savor to God. This is the very image. This is the shadow. Then the Bible says, we being many are one bread and one body. We're the bread. Now, let's finish reading this here. We enter in by a new and living way. We enter into the holiest. The holy of holies was the holiest. This was called God's house. By new and living, and the word is hodos. Way. The way into the holiest in the Old Testament was by a son of Aaron. The high priest, he had to be a high priest. He came in once a year into here and sprinkle that. But we enter in by a new and living hodos into the holy of holies. Hodos is the word way. Jesus said, I am the hodos. He said, narrow is the hodos that leads to life and few will have the high priest Melchizedek come in and sprinkle their hearts. Few. Now is the word. So this is really abstract terminology. I've said this before. But stop and think abstractness. Abstract means there's not a particular thing that you look at. It is very broad picture. Abstract. I think I got the word written down. Abstract. I got it written down in my Bible here. I was, abstract. Thought of apart from any particular instance or material object, not concrete. Concrete doesn't, it means something that you can reach out and put your hands on. If you think baptism is H2O and it's water, then what in the world does Jesus mean when he says to James and John and Mark 10, can you be baptized with the baptism I'm baptized with? Do you think can means ability? Are you able to be dipped in water? That would be ridiculous, wouldn't it? Baptism is blood. So, where was I? Prayers of the saints. Now, we enter in by a new and living way. The way into the holiest is the narrow way because Jesus said, I am thee, I am thee. Thee is a definite article. It means there's no other but this one narrow way. Thee eliminates every other way. The definite article thee. If he said, I am a way, it, that means there could be other ways. But when he said, I am the way, definite article means there's no other. And if he says narrow is the way, then the way into the holiest is the narrow way. Narrow is the word thelebo. It means to crowd through or open. Like you're going through a turnstile. It's one on one. It's you and God, nobody else. It comes from the base word thelipsis. And every time you find the word tribulation in the New Testament, many times you find the word affliction. But every time you find the word tribulation, it is the word thelipsis. We must do much tribulation enter the kingdom of God. Acts 14, 22. So, the way into the Holy of Holies now 
is tribulation, persecution, trials, fire. This is the way into the holiest, which is our hearts, into the house of God, whose house are we? And aren't we the temple of God? Now, let's keep reading. By a new and living way, which he hath consecrated for us through the veil. Here's the veil right here. Now, what's the veil? What happened to all this over here in the Old Testament? Colossians 2.14, the law was not blotted out. The rituals of the law were blotted out. Blotting out the handwriting of ordinances. There's two handwritings, one on tables of stone, the other on fleshy tables of the heart. Which one do you think was blotted out? Tables of stone. All the rituals over here are being fulfilled in us in the New Testament. So tribulation, fire and trials causes us to mature. And a blood baptism was a death, wasn't it? And when our hearts are sprinkled, like the Ark of the Covenant was sprinkled, and the heart was a place of understanding, that's death to the old self, death to the old me, death to my understanding and understanding spiritually. Do I learn that all at once? No. It takes years to learn that. Now, of course, you got the seven candlesticks out here. you got the, the table of showbread, so forth. Let's read the rest of this. So this once a year, tenth day of the seventh month, the high priest went in there and sprinkled the Ark of the Covenant. Let's read, keep reading. We enter in by a new living way, which he hath consecrated through the veil. That is to say, the veil, i.e., his flesh. When you see i.e., that means that is to say. Another term for the veil is his flesh. That's what it means. So, the veil equals the flesh. Now, what is the flesh? John 6. I've got to go through this. John 6. Jesus says he is the bread that's come down from heaven. But he's in us, isn't he? All right. Now, the veil is his flesh. I'm going to say something, but I don't think I'll say it yet. All right. John 6. Now, here's what the flesh is. John 6. Verse 51, I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If any man eat of this bread, he shall live forever. And the bread that I will give is my flesh. Then the bread and the veil are the same thing, aren't they? Bread <coughs> equals <coughs> mm. equals flesh all right now let's keep reading here and the bread is the flesh which i will give for the life of the world and the jews therefore strove among themselves saying can this man give us his flesh to eat then Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Except you eat the flesh of the Son of Man. What if I said eat the bread? What if I said partake of the veil? You won't have to partake of what's inside the veil, aren't we? And drink his blood, you have no life in you. Boy, that... Of course, to drink blood was to drink of a cup, and that's an old ancient idiom that means death to self. Yeah, where can you find that? Look up cup in McClinic and Strong, and they'll tell you all about the cup of salvation. Uh, Israel is a cup of trembling, and whoever touches Israel, there'll be a cup of trembling, and you have that all through Scripture. Jesus said, 
Father, if it be thy will, let this cup pass from me. He didn't say let this grape juice pass from me. He said let this cup, let this death, if it be thy will, nevertheless thy will be done. Whoso eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood hath eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is meat indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. Another word indeed is A-L-E-T-H-E-S. It means of truth. Of truth. Aletheia, A-L-A-T-H-E-I-A, is the word truth. And aletheia, truth, comes from the word lanthano. Lanthano means to lie hid. Placing the alpha in front of a word as a negative particle negates the word, gives an opposite meaning. It means not to hide anything. When you eat the flesh of Christ... You don't hide anything. Well, what is flesh? Flesh is the word sarks. And it is feminine gender. Flesh is feminine? When he says, the veil is the flesh, flesh is feminine. What is the flesh of Christ? The church, isn't it? It's the bread 1 Corinthians 10, 17. We being many are one bread and one body. So the bread is the body. Bread equals the body. And what's the body? The church. We partake of the church there in Colossians, the first chapter. Colossians, first chapter. Gosh, I didn't mean to get into this, but this I've got to kind of put all this in this study. Colossians first chapter. And then we'll finish. All right. Colossians one. Colossians one. And then I'll take you to Colossians two. Colossians one. Verse eighteen. He is the head of the body. The church. And I keep asking, how many bodies are there? Ephesians 4. Fourth chapter there, he says, in fourth chapter, verse 4, there is one body. And we're partakers of the same body in Ephesians, the third chapter. So the body is, the body is the bread, it's the flesh, it's the veil. This is very abstract, and we enter in by tribulation and trial. Can you get that? I've said that a bunch of times. Well, I don't know how that works. You have to think abstract. We're thinking of spiritual, how we enter in, how Christ enters in through the veil, sprinkles his blood upon us. This is New Testament. And if you look over here in Colossians, or look at Colossians one twenty four who now rejoice in my sufferings for you and fill up that which is behind of the afflictions of Christ in my flesh for his body's sake, which is the church. The body is the bread. The bread is the flesh. The flesh is the veil of the temple, which temple you are. And the first temple we see in Exodus, the 25th chapter, is a shadow of everything that's to come which is in us. Here's the temple of God right here. It's me. It's you when you're a believer. Now, he says here in chapter 2 of Colossians. Verse 14, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances. Well, there's two handwritings, one on tables of stone, one on fleshy tables of the heart. Luke 11 says, if I were the finger of God, cast out devils. Damn on Cast out devils, demons are self. Then the kingdom of God or Israel has come to you. And he wrote upon tables of stone in the ninth chapter of Deuteronomy and throughout the Old Testament scriptures, blowing out the handwriting of rituals, which was contrary to us, took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross, doing away with one contract, which is the old contract over here, and establishing a new contract, which is spiritual Israel, spiritual circumcision, he says, that was contrary to us, took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. They always drove a nail through the contract 
when he's invalidating a contract. And they started a new contract. And John said in John the second chapter, he says, I declare unto you a new commandment, which is not a new commandment. It's the same old commandment, but it's spiritual. Then he says, having spoiled principalities and powers, he may have a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. Therefore, Colossian Gentile church, don't let any man judge you in Jewish dietary laws there in the 11th chapter of Leviticus. In meats or in drinks or in Jewish libations where they poured out these drink offerings or in respect of any holy days. No, don't let any man judge you <clears throat> that you're not keeping Pentecost or Passover or Day of Atonement or the Feast of Ingathering or of holy days or of any new moons which were Jewish holidays. They went started in March, April, March, April, which was the month Nisan, and went to the seventh month. That was their ecclesiastical year. The seventh month, which was September, October, and the first of each one of those seven months, they sounded a trumpet and they called it a new moon festival. He said, don't let anybody judge you in new moon feast of the Jews or of any Sabbath days. Don't want anybody to tell you you have to be keeping the seventh day because every day is the Sabbath now. And then he says, which are a shadow. The same word is Hebrews 10 and 1. The law having a shadow, a shade, but not the image. And then he says, which are a shadow of things to come, but the body, the true body of Christ, is the temple, and that's you. Now, let me go back over here to Hebrews. Hebrews, the 10th the chapter. 10th chapter. And by... We enter in by the blood of Jesus Christ into the holiest, verse 19, by a new and living way which he hath consecrated for us through the veil, which is the same thing as the flesh, which is the bread, which is the body, which is the church. That's, a, that's an algebra axiom. The bread, the veil, equals the, the flesh. Equals the bread. Equals the body. Equals the church. There's an axiom in algebra that says, and it is a axiom in reality of all life. Things that are equal to the same thing are equal to each other. If the veil is the flesh and the veil is the church, the veil is the body, the veil is the bread. If the flesh is the veil, then the flesh is the bread, and the flesh is the body, and the flesh is the church. If the bread is the flesh and the veil, it is the body, it's the church. And if the body is the bread and the church, it's the flesh and the veil. Isn't it? That's not even hard to understand. And then he says, <clears throat> having a high priest over the house of God, he says in this same book, Hebrews 3, 6, Christ is the son over his own house, and this was called the house of God. The Holy of Holies was called God's house because he came out of the Shekinah glory and sat down on the Ark of the Covenant and married Israel and lived there. It means to build a house or marry. That's what it means. Why people don't understand this is beyond me. They'll say, well, the book of Hebrews was written to Hebrew Christians. It was written to us. What's it doing in the New Testament? It wasn't for us. Having a high priest. Who is the high priest in chapter 7 and chapter 8 and chapter 6? Who is it? Priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. You had Melchizedek forever. To be a priest anywhere in the Bible and offer sacrifice, you have to be a priest. When Abel offered a blood sacrifice, was he a priest of God? He had to be. You died if you wasn't a priest offering sacrifice. Where did he get the idea? From his father. 
Where did his father Adam get it from? When God killed an animal to cover their, their sin in the garden. They took some fig leaves, the works of their hands, and Abel did what his father said and offered blood. And he got it from Jesus, pre-incarnate, before he was called Jesus. He was Jehovah in the garden who walked with, with Adam. That was Jesus before he was called Jesus. Jesus was a priest in the garden killing that animal, wasn't he? Who was he then? He held the order of Melchizedek, which means priest of Salem or, or king of Salem or king of peace. He was that king of peace here. And then he holds that office till you get to the Aaronic priesthood. Aaronic priesthood. And then the, the, the sins of Aaron are priest until Jesus dies on the cross and nails all that to the cross. And he's back to being the priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. And he's sprinkling our hearts. Having a high priest over the house of God, whose house are you? Let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled inside the house of God. How can men miss that? Because they don't believe in spiritual Israel. They don't believe the church is spiritual Israel. Having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience. Boy, I could stay all day long on conscience. Don't have time. And our bodies washed with Pure water. What's pure water? Living water. And Jesus says living water in John 4 is the Holy Spirit. This is all very abstract terminology. We're washed with the Spirit of God. Isn't that a Holy Spirit baptism? And the Holy Spirit's truth. And when you tell the truth, you die for it. And that's a blood baptism. Isn't that right? It's all the same thing. Now, look over here in... Hebrews 8. Let's look at this other time the word shadow is mentioned. You got the shadow mentioned here. Over, you got it over in Colossians, the second chapter. You, got it in, you have it in uh, Hebrews, the tenth chapter. Look here. Verse 1. Now, of the things which we have spoken, this is the sum. We have such an high priest, such an is referring back to the previous chapter where it's talking about Melchizedek can't get into all of them and he talks about Melchizedek in the fifth chapter in the sixth chapter in the seventh chapter who is set on the right hand of the throne of the majesty in heavens now people think God is they think God the father is an old man with a long beard because Jesus is set in the right hand right hand just merely means the place of authority where a prince would sit doesn't mean there's a literal throne up there since God is a spirit no man has seen God the father at any time then He's not sitting on a literal throne. That's figurative language. A minister of the sanctuary of the true tabernacle. The true tabernacle. Wait a minute. Let's go back over here to Exodus, the 25th chapter. Exodus 25. The first time, the first time the word tabernacle is mentioned in the Bible, in Exodus, the 25th chapter, God's going to start giving instructions how to build the tabernacle that wasn't the true tabernacle. We're the true tabernacle. Look here. Exodus, the 25th chapter, and verse... I'm in Leviticus. I won't ever find it there, will I? No. I thought, what am I doing over here? 25th chapter, verse 9. What he says in verse 8, Let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them, that I may live with them. Talking about Israel, according to all that I show thee from the pattern of the tabernacle. And he's going to start giving instructions for the tabernacle, which is just the shadow, and we're the very image. And the pattern of all the instruments thereof, even so shall you make it. Now we're going to look at all the 
shadows that we can see, and we're going to see how we are the spiritual in the new. Now, go back over here. So when he's talking about the tabernacle over here, that's a shadow. We're the real. And he says that in verse 2 of chapter 8 of Hebrews, a minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle. Now, in the New Testament, in the New Testament, the word tabernacle is the word skinne. All right, let me just get me something to mark that with. Skinne, S-K-E-N-E. This is the word tabernacle in the New, S-K-E-N-E. And it's, uh, it actually means a tent. Now, it comes from the word, it's a derivative of the word skews, S-K-E-U-S. This word skews means a vessel or an implement for habitation. And it actually means a wife wife contributing to the usefulness of the husband and does not Christ dwell in us the wife the, who is going to be the bride when we're taken out he dwells and lives in us in our hearts and he's written his law in our hearts and that's this word look over here in Revelation look in Revelation the 13th chapter Revelation 13. It's talking about the beast. The beast is Babylon, Persia, Greece, and Rome. And how that the fire worship of the Roman Empire was implemented into Catholicism. And then Catholicism has branched out and seduced the world into self. And here in Revelation, the 10th chapter. Oh, 13, excuse me. 13. Revelation 13. Speaking of the beast, like a lion, a bear, and a leopard, which is the same beast as Daniel 7, the lion, the Babylonian lion, the Persian bear, and the Grecian leopard, and the beast with iron teeth. That was Rome. You find that same, when God says, I'll meet Israel, I'll meet him like a lion, a bear, and a leopard, or like these empires that carried him off into captivity in Hosea 13. Then he says, this beast, this dragon, which is a world ruling system, it's not a man. I keep saying when it says his and him, the word is A-U-T-O-U. That's the word him and his. We get the word A-U-T-O or self or him or her, her. And you always have to follow the gender of the antecedent. The beast is the word totherion. And it is neuter gender. So, you cannot say Jim went to the store, it bought some bread. You have to, the antecedent is the noun or pronoun where you got this him, the dragon gave him his power, his seat, and his great authority. It's not possible for the word to be him and his because the word autu refers back to the beast, which is neuter gender. If I say, uh, Judy threw the ball. Uh, it, referring back to Judy, it missed. So the beast is an it. Beast is an it. Okay. It's impossible for it to be a him. It was a it over in the Old Testament. It was the lion, the bear, and the leopard of Daniel 7. It was the lion, the bear, and the leopard of Hosea 13. And it's still the same lion, bear, and leopard. It's a world ruling system. Now, and I'm not going to go into one of the heads. A head was a capital city of an empire, and one of the heads was wounded to death. That was the Roman Empire that was outlawed, the fire worship system, reinstituted into Roman Catholicism. And they worshiped the dragon, verse 3, which gave power unto the beast, and the dragon, Dracon. I don't want to get into this. This is all night. Can I just kind of skip some of this? I love teaching on Revelation. They worshiped the beast, saying, Who is like unto the beast who is able to make war with him? And there was given unto him it, given unto it a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies, and power was given unto it to continue forty and two months. That's three and a half years, 1260 days. That's the last half of the 
last seven years of time, of the 70th week of Daniel, seven weeks. And he opened it, and it opened its mouth in blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name and God's tabernacle. The word tabernacle is the word skews, the church. The church is going to be attacked at the end of time, and it's under attack now, spiritually, because people don't believe these truths. And them that dwell in heaven, and heaven was the place of the the rule. Look over here in Revelation 21. Revelation 21. And I saw new heaven and new earth. Of course, we find that phrase the first time in the 65th chapter of Isaiah where God says, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have new heavens and new earth. Heaven is the ruling class. The earth is the rule. Israel was ruling everybody as long as they were obedient to God. When they quit being obedient to God, God says, I'm going to have new heavens, which is the church. So new heaven and new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth were passed away. Earth was the ruled. Heaven was the ruling class. Get your McClinic and Strong. Look up heaven. And it'll tell you heaven and earth in there. When, when some man says, I'll move heaven and earth to get to that woman, it means I'll move all the ruling people and all the ruled. And there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem. That's heavenly Jerusalem, the church of the firstborn. This is the picture of, this is the picture of being born again. New Jerusalem, heavenly Jerusalem, the church. In the eleventh chapter of Revelation, literal Jerusalem is referred to as Sodom and Egypt, even where our Lord was crucified. He's not talking about literal Jerusalem. He's talking about the church here, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride. What is the wife of Christ that's going to be the bride? The church. Adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men. Excuse. The wife. When she's born, she comes down from heaven. And I went through this in my Revelation series. So here's the tabernacle of God which is with men. And he will dwell with the tabernacle. And they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be the God of the tabernacle. Right? Mm-hmm. Now, let's go back to Hebrews 8. The reason people can't understand the Bible, they pull a verse out and say, what do you think that means? Yeah. I don't know. Let's look at what it says all over the Bible. Now go back to Hebrews 8. In verse 3, For every high priest is ordained to offer gifts and sacrifices, wherefore it is of a necessity that this man, this man who is a priest forever after the order, the word order is the word taxes. comes from the word, we get it, tactical or tact. Tactical is a military term. It means to march in rank. From taxes comes the word tasso. It means an orderly arrangement. As many as were ordained to eternal life believed. Acts 13, 48. Tasso. <clears throat> a taxis is a series of people or events. Being a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek, he, was, he held the office of Melchizedek in the beginning But when Abel came along, you didn't have an Aaronic priesthood, did you? There's only two royal priesthoods in the Bible, the Aaronic priesthood and the Melchizedek priesthood. Which priesthood did Abel have to belong to to offer a blood sacrifice? He had to be in the order of Melchizedek. When priests are offering sacrifices, they've got to be in one of the two orders, Melchizedek, Aaronic. But the ironic was blotted out. But it wasn't here yet. Here, was it? Anyone else? Was Noah? When we see the lineage of God in Genesis, the fifth chapter, and we start with Adam, Seth takes the place of Abel, and all these, if he takes the place of Abel, he's taking the place of the priesthood, isn't he? 
I believe all those men in Genesis 5 are priests of God because Noah comes out of the ark and he offers a sacrifice to God according to what order? Melchizedek. And when you see Abraham meets Melchizedek in, act, in Genesis, the 14th chapter, and Shem is, blessed be the Lord God of Shem, Shem outlives Abraham 15 years. I believe Shem is holding the order when Abraham comes and offers sacrifice. Then when you get the Aaronic priest, anyone who's offering sacrifice as a priest of God has to be in that order. Jesus started it in Genesis, the third chapter, and then when all of this is nailed to the cross here, then he's back to sprinkling our hearts, isn't he? That's what it's about. Now, Look here in chapter 8. Verse 4. For he, if he were on earth, this Melchizedek order, priesthood, which is Christ, which is not on earth now, at this point, he should not be a priest, seeing that there are priests that offer gifts according to the law, who serve unto the Example, hupodema, to exhibit before the eye. Hupo, D-E-I-G-M-A. To exhibit under the eye. They're an example, and then it says, and shadow. They were a shadow of Christ who was to come to sprinkle our hearts, weren't they? That's what they were. Now, who were a shadow of heavenly things. <clears throat> we talked about all those holy days and Sabbaths and new moons in Colossians, the second chapter, were a shadow. We've talked about Hebrews 10 and 1, the law having a shadow. He's saying everything in the Old Testament was shadow. We're the real thing. We're God's temple. Who serve unto the example and shadow of heavenly things, and Moses was admonished of God when he was about to make the tabernacle. That's talking about Exodus, the 25th chapter, when he's about to make the tabernacle, when he's given these instructions. That's where we got to. Do you think Exodus has anything to do with this? Does that have anything to do with us? Everything. For see, saith he, that thou Make all things according to the pattern. Tupas is the word pattern. Type. It's a type of us. But the real thing is us. The real Jew is us. We're circumcised with a circumcision made without hands. We're baptiz baptized with the baptism of Christ, which is blood. Then he says... There a shadow. The pattern was showed to them in the mount in verse 5. And now he hath obtained a more excellent ministry in us. Can you see that? By how much also he is a mediator of a better covenant. Better than the one that was all rituals in the Old Testament. All these, everything over here was a picture and a type of us, wasn't it? which was established upon better promises than this over here. For if that first covenant had been faultless, this one right here, if that had been faultless, then should no place have been sought for the second which is in us. Can we see that? I'm trying to go real slow and cover a lot of things I've covered before because it goes along with this tabernacle that God's telling him Moses to build starting in the 25th chapter of Exodus. For finding fault with them, he saith, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel. Whose house are we? People that don't like the church being Israel 
In Israel, the church can't see any of this. They hate that. Dispensationalists hate this. Dispensationalism says the Jews are over here and the church is this dispensation. The only problem is the word dispensation is the word O-I-K-O-N-O-M-I-A. It's the same word as stewardship. And orkonomeo is the word steward. Now, steward is one who takes care of a house. It comes from oikos, which is house, nomos, law. It's the law of the house of God. That's us. Well, goodness, I guess I ought to read that. I mean, I've quoted it all night. Hebrews 3. Hebrews 3 for people who are going to doubt this. So you just paraphrase that. No, I didn't. Hebrews 3. Verse 6. But Christ is a son over his own house. Whose house are we? It doesn't say if. It says holding fast the confidence and the rejoicing of the hope firm unto the end. And that's what we do. Now back to Hebrews 8. If the first covenant had been faultless in verse 7, then we should have no place for a spiritual or the very image of the second. For finding fault with them, he said, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, I will make a covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, and they're going to come back together and be one there in Ezekiel the 37th chapter and Isaiah the 11th chapter. Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers, then this is going to be something different, isn't it? It's the church that I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand and led them out of the land of Egypt, and that's where we are in Exodus 25. Because they continued not in my covenant, and I regarded them not, saith the Lord. For this is the covenant that I will make with my, with the house of Israel, or my spiritual Israel, and Israel. They're not all of Israel, which have obtained the election has obtained this and the last were blinded. God's elect are those who he's chosen to be spiritual Jews. A Jew is not outwardly, but of the heart. And the house of God is spiritual, and that's us. That I will make the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord, I will put my laws in their mind and write them in their hearts, and I will be to them a, peop- a God, and they shall be my people. And that is not talking about literal Jews. That's talking about spiritual. Talking about spiritual circumcision. It's talking about us becoming part of the same body of the church there in Ephesians, the second and the third chapter. We're no longer aliens from the commonwealth of Israel. We've been, now we are joint heirs with them. Now, he says, I will write, I'll put my laws in their mind and write them in their hearts and I will be to them a God and they shall be my people. Now, Let's go back over here to Exodus, the 25th chapter. Everything that we're going to see in this 25th chapter is going to be about what's going on in the New Testament, us, the church. Now, he's talking, the first time we see the word temple the first time we see the word temple in the Old Testament is over in 1 Samuel, the first chapter. Wow. The first place we see tabernacle, which means temple, is over here in the 25th chapter of, of Exodus. 25th chapter, verse 9. According to all that I show unto thee after the pattern of the tabernacle. And we've said that word is the word Mishkan means a residence and that's where God lives. It means a temple or a habitation or a place to dwell. Well, he's in us, isn't he? Colossians one twenty seven. Christ in you, the hope of glory. If he's in you, is he living in you? I am in you, you are in me there in John 14. And then he says here in the second time you find the word tabernacle mentioned is in 26. Chapter 26, verse 1. Moreover, thou shalt make the tabernacle with ten curtains and fine twine linen and blue and purple and scarlet 
with cherubim of cunning work shalt thou make them. And he goes through here and gives you all the dimensions of the tabernacle, the curtains, how wide they are, the toshes, the knobs, the the various, the goat's hair, the... What's amazing, he says, cover the tabernacle with ram skins dyed red. Are we covered with the red? With the blood of Christ. That's death to self. And our hearts are sprinkled with the blood, aren't they? And the Ark of the Covenant is sprinkled. I can't see, I can't see why people can't see that our hearts are the Ark of the Covenant. He's blotted out this over here. Then this goes along with these crazy preterists that say, Jesus came back in 70 A.D. to reveal himself to the Jews in the temple. Wait a minute. In 33 A.D., when he was nailed to the cross, he did away with all this over here. What's he doing coming back to the Jews that he's not going to let see him? It's crazy to come up with, well, in 70 A.D., a flash of lightning went through the temple. That's idiocy. He's not going to let the Jews... When did he blind them? In Luke, the 19th chapter, when he's coming to Jerusalem, be crucified, he looked out over Jerusalem and said, If thou hast known even thou in this thy day, the things that belong to thy peace, but now they're hidden from your eyes, and you're blind this day. And he's going to come back 30-something years later because he's going to, hoping they'll see him? That's ridiculous. Preterist. That's the wildest, stupidest doctor I've ever heard. And, of course, they always go to the 16th chapter of Matthew. There's some here that will not taste death till see Christ coming in his kingdom. Christ's kingdom, the kingdom of God is in you. The church was born in Acts 2. Not in 70 A.D. That wasn't the kingdom of God. He canceled out the literal Israel, the little Jew, and now God's Israel are those of the heart great day in the morning i can't believe these guys will believe that garbage i can't believe intelligent doctors of theology will believe it somebody like rc Sproul, he doesn't understand this that's for sure now when you get in here we talked about making notice the first thing he made was the ark of the covenant wasn't it that's the first thing. The Ark of the Covenant is the piece of furniture that's above all pieces. It is a judgment seat. A judgment seat is a mobile throne. Everywhere the tabernacle moved, that moved with it, and God came and sat down on the judgment seat. What is the great white throne? That Solomon had a throne of ivory when it was established in the temple of God. It was a great, called a great white throne. And that, I don't need to get into that. That's another story. Now, if you'll notice, he says here in chapter 25, I need to go ahead and cover some more. If you'll notice, verse 17. Wait a minute. In verse after he talks about the staves, which I talked about last week, put inside of the rings in the Ark of the Covenant, they had to be carried. We went through that. Everything had to be carried with those rings. The Ark of the Covenant, looking at it from the top, had these rings. It had to be carried by those staves that were never taken out of the ark. And that's why God killed Uzzah, because he reached up and touched the ark, because they couldn't touch the ark of the covenant. If they did, they died. Then he says here in verse 16, And thou shalt put into the ark the testimony which I shall give thee. Testimony was the law. The ark of the testimony meant the ark of the law. When you see the ark of the testimony in Scripture... It's talking about the law that was on tables of stone inside the ark. The law is written on flesh tables of our hearts. Now, let's look back at Hebrews, the ninth chapter. Hebrews 9. Now, later on, they're going to come across the manna. 
later on, they're going to come across Aaron's rod that budded. And over here, and Aaron's going to be the spiritual leader. He's supposed to be. He wasn't very good at sometimes. <clears throat> Hebrews. People say Hebrews is a hard book to read. It, it's a hard book to teach. It is if you don't believe in spiritual Israel. It's not hard at all when you know that we, the church, are heavenly Jerusalem, the church. Goodness gracious, what's so hard about that? We come to Mount Zion, heavenly Jerusalem, the church. The Mount Zion is us. The word Zion, by the way, means sunny. And we are pro horizo, predetermined for the light, the sunny light. Now, Hebrews 9, look at verse nine, chapter 9, verse 1 of Hebrews. Then verily the first covenant had also ordinances, and may I add, which were nailed to the cross with Christ, right? Of divine service and worldly sanctuary. I believe that word comes from the word cosmos. It means earthly or arrangement. For there was a tabernacle made. And that's the one he's telling him in the 25th chapter of Exodus. And in the 26th chapter of Exodus, verse 1, to make. For there was a tabernacle made first. Wherein was the candlestick? Right there. Here's the tabernacle. There's the Holy of Holies. This is the outer sanctuary. And there was a candlestick there. Right there. Candlestick. And the table. And showbread. Which is called the sanctuary. You got showbread right here. Right there. And showbread, which is called the sanctuary. And after the second veil, which is called the holiest of all. Here's the first veil here coming in. This is the second veil. Half here is the holiest. The house of God, whose house are we? Where he lives. <clears throat> holiest of all, which had the golden censer and the ark of the covenant overlaid round about with gold. And inside the Ark of the Covenant was a golden pot that had manna and Aaron's rod that budded and the tables written on by the finger of God. That was inside here. What is the censer? What? Finger of God. Those tables. Huh? Yes, but God gave him some new ones, the Bible says. And, and he wrote well, God, no, no. God wrote new commandments and gave them to Moses. I went through that several weeks ago. I'm not going to go through that right now. I went through that several weeks ago. He broke them, and then God made him a new set of commandments. God did it and gave them to him. He put them in, he put them in here. Now, where's the censer? Between the cherubim, many of the writers say, the golden censer, you had the altar of incense. Some say that they took fire from the altar, took incense, put it up on the golden censer, and brought it inside the ark and laid it down between the cherubim. So that's why it says the censer was inside the Holy of Holies. But the incense was taken off of this, put inside the censer, and it had to fill up all of this house of God with smoke so that the high priest couldn't see God. And he had to get out on his face after he sprinkled the Ark of the Covenant seven times. He had to get on his face and he couldn't look up because if he looked up and saw God, God struck him dead. That's why some believe they tied a rope around the high priest, his leg, just in case he made a mistake, looked at God and died. They could drag him out and say, all right, then which one of you sons is next? Who? You want that? You want to be the next high priest to go in there? Not me. 
If he did one thing wrong, he'd die right there. Man, God was serious, wasn't he? All right. Now, where was I? Now, back over here to Hebrews 9. And he says, that's what's inside the ark in verse 4. And over it, over the ark of the covenant, cherubims of glory, shadowing the mercy seat of which we cannot now speak particularly. Now, let's go back over to Exodus 25. Exodus 25. Now, it's going to take a while to go through this. How much time do I have, Mike? 18. Not moving very fast. Verse 17, Exodus 25. Thou shalt make a mercy seat of pure gold. Now, the mercy seat, according to the writers, was not a part of the ark. It set up on the ark. It had its own measurements. That's where God set. That was his throne. It set up on the ark. God had to look through the blood that was sprinkled on the ark of the covenant to see the sins of the people. And when I see the blood, death would pass over him when he looked through the mercy seat. When he looked through the blood, sprinkled on the mercy seat, and he saw the sins were forgiven because the goat had been killed. On the day of atonement, that's the 16th chapter of Leviticus, we see the the, what they call the scapegoat. It's actually it's Azazel, which was an old ancient term for Satan. And the blood of that goat was sprinkled there. Scapegoat is only, it's mentioned four times in the Bible. All four times is Leviticus, the 16th chapter. That's a description of the Day of Atonement when you read it. And I'm going to come back to the mercy seat next week because there's so much to say on that. The word mercy seat in 1 John 2 and 2, he is the propitiation for our sins. Haliosmos, mercy seat, and propitiation are the same word in the Greek. But I don't want to get to that right now. Look here. Thou shalt make two cherubim. It's pronounced cherubim. Probably not the full pronunciation because they had so many guttural sounds. <laughs> the Jews did. Cherubim. Probably something along that line. <laughs> did a lot of the, that in their speech. Some people say, you're pronouncing that wrong. Nobody's pronouncing any of it right. Even in the Greek, they had musical tones to all the words 2,000 years ago, and we lost the musical tones a long time ago. So if somebody says, Jim Brown, it's hados, not hodos. It looks like hodos, and I don't really care how you pronounce it. I want you to pronounce it the way it looks, phonetically, so we can remember it, Okay. Nobody is a Greek expert anyway. And you Greek teachers know that. <laughs> by, by no means, because I'll read something Mr. Mount says, I'll say, it ain't right. Everything you study, you have to be very discriminating, very, use all of the, the evaluation you can. Then he says, Two cubits and a half shall be the length of the mercy seat. And a cubit and a half the breadth of the mercy seat. That's not the Ark of the Covenant. It sits on top of the Ark of the Covenant. And that's what's sprinkled. That's the propitiation. That's the substitute. And thou shalt make two cherubims of gold. Of beaten work thou shalt make them in the two ends of the mercy seat. So, they're on each end of the Ark of the Covenant facing each other. And the writers say they went all the way to the curtain. So their wings were a long way. And this guy, Ron White, supposedly found the Ark of the Covenant and the wings are about that long and they don't go all the way over past the end of the Ark of the Covenant. Ron was a con. Huh? What? Well, I know Ron White was a con. I went to a meeting with him. I went to a meeting up here at Bonanza years ago and he come up and said, <clears throat> and he's supposedly discovered Noah's Ark uh, in the mountains of Ararat in eastern Turkey. Mm -hmm. And uh, he's up there and showing this film and he's showing a film showing Noah's Ark National Park and he's up there 
in this film putting his approval on these Arabs offering a goat at the entrance to the park. I'm going, oh, good grief. And then at the end of it, he wanted questions and answers. And I said, Ron, I want to ask you a question. Can you tell us about your experience with Christ and when you began to believe God and repentance came to your life? He said, well, I don't believe in talking about that in public. That's a man's own private business. That was Ron White. He's world famous for, for, he's a world famous jerk. He's dead now. And one guy, we walked out of the bananas, he said, did you ever get the answer to your question? I said, not yet. He was trying to be a, he thought he was brilliant because he was an anethodist, not a Methodist, but an anethodist. And because he went into archaeology and everything he says in his paper is just fooey. It's wrong. He didn't know the Bible. He may have knew something about archaeology and medicine, but he didn't know the Bible. He didn't know that the length of those cherubim wings. So you had a cherubim on each end of the ark. But I thought there were four cherubim around the ark of the covenant. Yes, there were. Look here. He says here, one cherubim on one end and one cherub on the other end, even of the mercy seat shall thou make cherubims on two ends thereof. And the cherubim shall stretch forth their wings on the high covering. The mercy seat with their wings and their faces shall look one to another. Toward the mercy seat shall the faces of the cherubim be. So does that mean that the wings are facing toward each other across the mercy seat? Yeah, like that. The wings are going touching the wall over there. Well, Ron White's don't touch the wall. They're, they're just, you see the Ark of the Covenant and here's these cherubim here and their wings go like that and go like that that's wrong Ron that's a phony art well look over here where's the other two cherubim look over here in 26 26 he's talking about making the veil remember we said the veil the veil is the flesh is the body is the bread is the church isn't it Look over here in chapter thirty, chapter 26, 31. Thou shalt make a veil, but the veil is the flesh, isn't it? This is the shadow here that we're looking at. The shadow. Thou shalt make a veil of blue and purple. We went into these colors when we went into the eyes of the Lord. I'm not going to try to even go into colors right now. That's a, that'll fry your brain, getting to the eyes of the Lord. There's seven colors in the rainbow. When light goes through a prism, it breaks off into seven colors. And the lens of your eye is triangular-shaped prisms, one five-thousandth of an inch thick. And when the light goes in, it goes. It starts breaking into seven colors. And we're predestined to be conformed to the likeness of Christ. And Christ is represented in colors in Daniel 10 and Revelation 1 and Revelation 10. And the colors get sent to pretty heavy stuff. Thou shalt make a veil of blue and purple and scarlet and twine them twine linen of cunning work. With cherubims shall it be made. And you had two cherubim or two cherubim woven in here. And this was called the throne of God. And you had two cherubim facing each other. So you had two, you had four cherubim around the throne of God, didn't you? Look at Revelation, the fourth chapter. Remember, the heavens was what Israel was called, wasn't it? Look at Revelation, the fourth chapter. Well, I'm not going to get through this. Do I have any time, Mike? Ten minutes. Ten minutes. Look here, Revelation 4. And I looked, and behold, a door was opened in heaven. Heaven was Israel. That was a term for Israel, our kingdom of heaven. And heavens was the ruling class. I don't have time to go into that. I did series on that. And a door was opened in Israel. And we're spiritual Israel, right? And the first voice which I heard was as it were of a trumpet. We see a trumpet being a voice over here in Revelation, the first chapter. And he says, I heard a great voice as of a trumpet in verse 10. This is John. He says in chapter 4, verse 1, 
And the first voice which I heard was as it were a trumpet talking with me, which said, Come up hither. This is the trumpet saying, Come up hither. And I will show thee things which must be hereafter. And immediately I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne. Ark of the Covenant, that is God's throne. Our hearts. A throne was set in the heavens and one sat upon the throne. Where does Jesus come from? He comes out of the Shekinah of glory to set up on the ark, doesn't he? This sounds awful simple compared to what Jack Van Empey and these imbeciles do and Hal Lindsey. He sits upon the throne of our hearts, doesn't he? And notice what he says. And one sat on the throne, and he that sat was to look upon like a jasper and a sardine. I'll get back to the colors later. And there was a rainbow round about the throne. Seven colors in the rainbow. Goodness. Takes a lot of time to get into that. And round about the throne were four and twenty seats. Round the throne of God. How many orders of high priests were there under Aaron's two sons, Eliezer and Ithamar? Twenty-four. You can look at that in First Chronicles 24. First Chronicles 24. Talking about the sons of Aaron. These are the divisions of the sons of Aaron, the sons of Aaron, Nadab, Abihu, Eliezer, and Ithamar. Nadab and Abihu died before their father because they offered strange fire upon the altar of incense or in the golden censer. Probably took fire from the candlesticks, which just wasn't supposed to come from there. It had to come from the altar. Or they had the wrong incense in there, the wrong combination, wrong recipe. And it was at the morning of Eliezer that executed the priest's office. And there were more chief men found of the sons of Eliezer than the sons of Ithamar. All the high priests of Israel came from these two boys of Aaron. And there were divided among the sons of Eliezer were sixteen chief men of the house of the fathers and eight among the sons of Ithamar according to the house of their fathers. That's twenty-four. That's the twenty-four elders here sitting clothed in white raiment and they had upon their heads crowns of gold. In the 28th chapter of Exodus, they had upon their foreheads a gold plate that said, Holiness to the Lord, and they wore it around their forehead. And that showed that they were active high priests in Israel. And out of the throne proceeded lightnings and thunders and voices. Now, we don't know what that is. I guess when God come down there, he made some noise. And there were seven lamps of fire burning in front of the throne. How about the seven candlesticks? How about the church? The last verse. The last verse. The mystery of the seven stars which you saw in my right hand in verse 16 of chapter 1. And the seven golden candlesticks. The seven stars are the seven angels or the seven preachers or the seven angelos, messengers of the seven churches. And the seven candlesticks, which we're going to get into next week, are the seven churches. Seven is the number of refinement. And we'll get into that too next week. Goodness. So there's seven lamps in front of the throne. But he's just told us in the first chapter of Revelation, this is the refined church. Hasn't he? If you can't think abstract, you will never get the book of Revelation. And where did the seven candlesticks start? Exodus. And we're fixing to get into the seven candlesticks. Goodness sakes alive. How in the world can you have seven candlesticks in Revelation, the first chapter, and not go to Exodus? Isn't that crazy? Whoa, we can't understand Revelation because you're looking in the wrong place. The 25th chapter of Exodus, Thou shalt make a candlestick of pure gold of beaten work. Shall the candlestick be made in his shaft and his branch and his bowls and his knops and his flowers shall be 
the same and six branches shall come out of the sides thereof and you find Christ being the middle branch in the first chapter of Revelation. That's the very image, isn't it? And the seven candlesticks are the seven. Sheba is the Hebrew word. Shabua comes from Sheba. It means to take an oath to God. And seven is the number of refinement all through the Bible. The church has to be refined. So you got the church being the seven candlesticks. So when you find seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, that's the church standing in front of the throne of God. And I'm going to go into the candlesticks. And before the throne, there was a sea of glass. Brazen sea. Right here. There was a sea here. It was called a sea because it held 2,000 baths for the priests. It's called a sea. Right there. Of glass. Why is it called a sea of glass? Because Exodus 38 chapter. In Exodus the 30... Gosh, you've got to get your answers out of Exodus, don't you? Exodus 38 chapter... 38, <clears throat> verse 8, And Moses made the labor of brass and of the foot of it of brass of the looking glasses of the women assembling. He said, bring your looking glasses of brass to make the brazen sea. And they assembled at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. He got the women's looking glasses and made the glassy sea. <clears throat> And they've got, and these preachers got some sea up in heaven, and it's a glassy sea, and it's made out of glass, and you idiots. <laughs> but I can't know this stuff. This can't be true because I'm wearing a jeans and a and a sport shirt. You can't know this stuff if you're wearing jeans and a sport shirt. I need a three piece suit to be credible with a watch fob. This is mathematical. I was always good at math. I liked them. I loved math. I loved algebra. I loved trigonometry and geometry. If you just think mathematical, you can find all these answers in the Old Testament. <laughs> and then he says, and then he says, a sea of glass, like in a crystal, in the midst of the throne. Round about the throne were four beasts. Oh, Round about the throne were four cherubim, four beasts. And believe it or not, these four beasts are going to open the first four seals. If this is not abstractness, you're going to miss everything. And the first four seals are the beast, the sword, the famine, the pestilence. The four judgments of God that's been here since the garden. And I'm out of time. Whew. It's amazing, isn't it? Revelation is the answers start over at Exodus. And what amazes me, you got seven candlesticks in the first chapter, and God tells you what the candlesticks are. They're spiritual, they're the church, and and the seven stars in the right hand of Christ. And all these angels have seven trumpets, and as the star falls from heaven, that's the sounding of the trumpets. That's the and in the candlesticks, each one of these arms was called a trumpet and had oil inside of it. And that's the message from the messenger, and we're the candlesticks. And you start getting those instructions in Exodus, the 25th chapter. That's pretty simple stuff over there. What really gets heavy is get over here into the spiritual. And I went through this in this Revelation series I did some years ago. I love this message. I love spiritual Israel, spiritual circumcision. It doesn't make any sense any other way. These people who want Jack Van Empey and all of his ambulances and, and, uh, and uh, big holes in the ground and helicopters coming up and demons, and it's just dumb. It's, they're giving you a sales job. Well, let's pray. We'll come back next week. Continue. Father, thank you for truth. Lord, thank you for this word. Let us continue to see it, Lord. 
Lord, I pray for the flock that they learn these truths. I pray that you'll lead us to your elect and open up many doors for the ministry across America, throughout the TV and through the Internet. And call your elect. Cause them to lift up this ministry and support it, Lord. And help us to get, get this message to your elect family. God will praise you for all things. Help us, Lord. In Christ's name, amen.